Welcome to A Faith Dialogue with Bishop Robert J. Brennan for the third week of October and the 29th week of Ordinary Time. Welcome, Your Excellency. Hello, Bill. It's good to be talking with you in these very exciting days. It is. It is. Um, you know, we, we continue to read from Mark, um, and uh, this week he, there's a little bit of a trick question. Uh, the disciples ask, hey, we want you to do something special for us. Would you do it if we ask you? <laughs> whatever we ask of you, right? I mean, boy, <laughs> that's pretty nervy. We want you to do whatever we ask. Okay. It sounds like my grandson trying to get some candy. <laughs> And, you know, that is what it sounds like. And it's an interesting thing. Jesus challenges them on the question. It's part of that whole series that we've been reading about in Mark chapter 10 about trying to follow Jesus. Their hearts were good, but it's a struggle. And and it's just hard to let go of some of the um, earthly things. So what, what do they ask? They say, you know, Jesus says, well, what do you want? And they said, we want places of honor. One of us on your right, the other on your left, when you um, arrive in your kingdom. Well, is that the worst thing in the world that they're asking for? They're asking to be next to Jesus in heaven forever. It's a good good request. I have never heard that uh, twist. I think most of us think, well, that's pretty shallow for them to ask. But I think you're right. Their heart is the right place. The heart's in the right place. That's and, and th- that's very human because that is very shallow to ask. They got their they're they're aiming in the right place, but they're putting it in terms of places of honor, which looks like it is shallow. And I think Jesus tries to redirect them to where their hearts are leading them. To being with him in glory. Being with him in glory is prize enough. Doesn't matter who's first. It doesn't matter um, any kind of honor. We everyone in heaven is beloved by God and close to Jesus. That's the amazing, amazing thing that we can't even wrap our minds around in this earthly world. You see, that's just it. We have we, we only have what we experience here to go on it's in terms of images, and Jesus is drawing us into something deeper. And what does he say? How do you get there? He said, well, you must follow him. Are you ready to drink from the chalice that I will drink from? And they say yes, and by the way, they do, each in his own way. James is martyred very early on, John is exiled in face of what you might call the living martyrdom. But um, both drink from the chalice that the Lord drinks from, give their testimony for his gospel. But you see, at that point, they weren't ready to do it. They said, yes, yes, yes. But even the question reveals, no, they weren't quite ready. But they, when they saw what Jesus did, when they met him in the resurrection, and when he sent them his Holy Spirit, they were ready. And, and that's the key. That's the good news here. Their hearts are in the right place. They're still struggling with the basic human earthly things that we all struggle with. Last week it was the rich young man and his possessions. Earlier it was Peter and his fear of following Christ to Jerusalem. It's also we see it in the other apostles who get jealous and start pushing back. Um. That we all carry something, but, but Jesus is saying, remember the camel through the eye of the needle. If he's asking something of us, he will give us what we need to help us to achieve it. And ultimately, where he's leading us is to eternal life. And he'll give us what we need along the way. Even, even as we still try to, to hold on tight, he's gently helping us to be able to let go. He walks with us patiently. You know, last week during one of the weekday readings, we heard uh, St. Paul talking about mistaking the patience of God, thinking that the patience and the kindness of God, it it might be about God not really caring. It doesn't really matter. You know, everything goes. And he said, no, the patience of God is meant for repentance. God... 
we hear this often. God loves us so much, he meets us wherever we are. He meets you today, wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life. He's not waiting for you to clean up your act before he enters into your life. It's not contingent. It's not contingent. However, that same love of God, this is the part that gets missing. God also loves you so much that he's not going to let you stay there. God loves you too much to let you stay in that morass. So what's he going to do? He is going to walk patiently with you and gently challenge you, repeatedly challenge you, give you what you need and help you to see what you can do with his help, leading you ultimately to glory with Jesus Christ. That's it in the end. Um, and that's the great prize that James and John really are seeking in their heart, but they're still using our human categories. Speaking of challenges, um, the Holy Father is um, asking the bishops to meet in a multi-year synod starting yes. this next week. Yes. So um, it, it, this is it meant, means for this to be a global synod. Every few years there's an, an ordinary synod in the life of the church, and every, every once in a while there's an extraordinary one. This is the regular synod. But what he wants to do is include a conversation from the church around the world. And so what he's d d doing is asking that we do this in stages. So he opened it up on October 9th, and he's asking us in the coming weekend to open it up liturgically. So we'll talk a little bit about Mission Sunday, but this coming Sunday is Mission Sunday. I actually have the vigil mass um, at the cathedral, and we'll be celebrating Mission Sunday. And at that Mass, we'll also open officially the Synod. The interesting thing about the Synod is the Pope wants it to be a conversation. He's saying a synodal church journeys together, announcing the gospel. And he's asking us to reflect on what does it mean to journey together to announce the gospel, to listen to one another, to walk with one another, to share that joy of the gospel. Well, you know, rather than create something t entirely new here, we'll, we're going to be faithful to what the Holy Father is asking us and, and have this conversation. But we've already begun it here, haven't we, in Columbus? I think we have. That's exactly we have. what we're doing with Real Presence, Real Future. We begin by, well, we began, I should say, by kneeling down before the Lord and asking his help those 40 days of adoration, um, what a grace that was. And, and I can boast because I didn't come up with the idea and I didn't do the work. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just went around and, and enjoyed the fruits of it, prayed before the Lord with, with our wonderful people. But we began on our knees in adoration, asking the help of the Lord. We began with this Eucharistic event, this Eucharistic revival, um, as part of our return to Holy Mass after the whole experience of the pandemic, trying to invite people. So now we move into this consultation phase, and we know we're going to have to make some hard decisions. We're going to have to make, you know, we, we can't sustain every the number of parishes we have. We can't sustain doing everything the same way we've always done it. But what we really want to do is keep our eyes fixed, like what Jesus teaches James and John to do, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and his real presence and the real presence of Jesus in the life of the church throughout the 23 counties of central Ohio. So our synod experience, our diet, we've already started what the Holy Father has asked is that we have this conversation. So, you know, we may use some of these structures to, to pose some of the same questions. Really, that is the question. How do we journey together? Well, we're engaged in it right now. Um, and so we'll just kind of fold the two together. But we begin again, like the Holy Father asks us, with prayer. So this coming Saturday at 515, we'll have it live streamed. And, um, and we'll, um, we'll, be, we'll make it as widely available as possible. Um, and we'll ask people 
to join in prayer for the Holy Father's intention for this worldwide synod and very specifically for our own process of real presence, real future, as we, to use his words, journey together, listening carefully to the Lord. Is there a basis uh, of um, desire? You, you mentioned his intention. What is the intention of the synod? Because I know that uh, last year uh, the, the bishops met and um, yes. focused the attention on the Eucharist and the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist for the next five years. Is it a continuation of that theme? It, it, it's something along those lines. But basically he wants it to be wider. It's interesting. He's saying... Um, he wants us to begin by focusing on the Word of God, by focusing on the Word of God. But then he's asking us to listen to one another. That's his big thing. He wants us to um, to engage in a process to let the Holy Spirit work through our mutual listening to one another. And he he asks that we be pay attention to voices who maybe ordinarily have not been heard in the past. He says, each diocese can discern the most conducive ways of enabling a spirit-led synodal experience for its people, paying particular attention to those whose voices have not been heard in the past. So that's why we want to reach out far and wide. That's why we've been begging people to take part in our real presence, real future. Um, it's, it's essentially, what he's asking us to do is talk to each other and in that conversation, to listen carefully to the Holy Spirit who speaks through us. And, and that's, that's a great act of faith, isn't it? It is. I'm struck by our discussion on Mark 10, when the disciples say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And the open dialogue that our Pope Francis is asking for, and the open dialogue we're asking for, within our parishes. I think as we go into this, and, and uh, this, is, this is my observation, we have to be careful, too, as we start a dialogue, that we don't want things just our way. You know, teacher, do what you want. Right. Or, or do what we, we want, want for you. Right. Now, it's fair to express our hopes and our dreams because that's part of it. But I think we go into it with an attitude of humility, of boldness and humility, boldness, trusting Jesus Christ who's always with us and who leads us. Boldness to be able, like James and John, to say, I can approach the Lord. I can approach the Lord, and he will listen to me. But humility to say, Lord, here's my, these are my deepest hopes, but in the end, I trust you. You know? He, James and John don't walk away and say, well, we didn't get what we want, so sorry, see you later, Jesus. They said, yeah, well, drink from the chalice you drink from. And, and, and we'll, who want, the one who wants to be greatest must serve the rest, and we'll serve. And, of course, we know they did. So there's a boldness. Let's reveal our hearts. But there's a humility that says, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak through me exclusively and through you exclusively. But the Holy Spirit reveals something to us within our conversations with each other. And then that works its way through the church throughout the world. We um, will we'll take part in our diocesan conversation and we'll report in um, regionally and then the, the, the U.S. Uh, conference will gather responses and then um, there'll be a, a, a global synod in uh, 2023. So we're, we're working through this con. Uh, th this process. And, you know, you mentioned some of the work of the bishops before, Paul. It, it, it turned out to be mostly the Hispanic uh, world, but uh, the Encuentro process was similar. That was a, a U.S. version of that. The uh, Real Presence, Real Future was encapsulated with a quote uh, that I, I read from Father Harchi, uh, the uh, moderator for the Curia for the Diocese. And he's uh, overseeing this process, but he said that he wants and we want, and you want, and we all want a vibrancy of faith. That's right. 
exactly and 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 that's that's true in the synod as well but it's also but it's a big part of real presence real future how do we get a vibrancy of faith we get a vibrancy of faith by maybe making some sacrifices but being stronger together and and then um and um and being able to take the best of what we have in uh, all of our experiences and, and putting them at the service of one another. We have a vibrancy of faith through our enthusiastic living out of the gospel by, by 40 days of adoration, by our s- attending daily mass, by our invitation to others to join us. Maybe in very simple ways. Take as our model the Lord Jesus who walks very patiently with us. Maybe, you know, maybe it's not about getting everybody, somebody back to church every Sunday, but maybe it starts with just saying, would you come with me to this or that? You know, maybe it is next Lent, 40 days of adoration. Maybe saying to somebody, you know what, I have a few things to do. I'm going to stop at the church for about 10 minutes. The Lord is there. Would you want to come with me just for 10 minutes? You don't have to do anything or talk to anybody. Just be there for a few minutes. You know, um, simple little things we might do and count on the Lord's patience and our and his persistence with and through us to continue to invite people in deeper. Um, ultimately, to be able to say, would you love to, wouldn't you love to experience the fullness of, of, uh, of what Christ has to offer us at Holy Mass? Come with me. We may have to work our way up to that. You know, one of the greatest examples of a vibrant Catholic faith is John Paul II. So St. John Paul II, we're celebrating his feast day on Friday. Is there a picture that you have in your mind um, as it relates to St. John Paul II that kind of encapsulates what that vibrancy means to you and maybe what we can model? There are two. Um, One is from the beginning of his pontificate and one from the end. Uh, I'm sure there are many, but... um, Actually, uh, our team here has j- just framed it for me because I was I was talking about it. But I was um, 17 years old in 1979, a year after he was uh, elected pope, chosen to be the successor of Peter, and um, he came to the United States. And I was at Madison Square Garden where he had the youth event. And there's a picture of a very young John Paul II riding around. Madison Square Garden, full of energy, and I remember that day extraordinarily well. That was that that was transformational, and um, I remember his exuberance, his joy. Um, I've also used in some of my recent talks an image of the Holy Father of Pope John Paul on in the year two thousand, five years before he would die, at Mount Nebo. There he is older, a little bit more frail, and he's standing. He went to the Holy Land as part of the Jubilee, and that was the whole focus, if you will, of his pontificate, crossing the threshold into the new Jubilee of the presence of Christ in the world. It wasn't just, you know, a nice round number, year 2000, Y2K, remember that. That's not what it was about. It was the incarnation that the Jubilee was the Jubilee of the Incarnation. And so he went to the Holy Land. And there he is standing where Moses stood. Moses was told, you're not going to enter into the Promised Land, but I'm going to let you see it. And so God brought him up Mount Nebo so he could look out. And there's Pope St. John Paul looking out and realizing, I'm sure, that he did God's work bringing us to a point. And he was going to he was going to cross us over, but he wasn't going to be the Pope of the third millennium. He did what God asked him to do, and it's all in God's hands. And so now, of course, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis are they are leading us into this new era. And it, and let's be honest: in these twenty one years, the world has changed, and the Church. Um, keeps up. The church continues to proclaim the eternal truth of Jesus Christ, but has to meet new realities and new situations. 
just sometimes we think we just don't have enough. And uh, you were reflecting on uh, one of the chapters of um, apostolic mission. Right. Uh, and, and I think that it was interesting. Okay, the, the first apostles, they didn't have any schools. They only had 12. They didn't have any lay men or women catechized and, and, nope. and knowledge of the faith. Yet, <laughs> no money, the vibrancy no still... Vi- with, but they had the Holy Spirit. Still worked, yes. And that was the most powerful missionary moment in the history of humanity. Yeah. And they, they did it. And, but that same Holy Spirit is at work today. Yes, in, indeed. And along those lines, you know, last week we spoke a little bit about the three themes that are so strong in October, um, the, the rosary, respect life, and the missions. And this Sunday, we celebrate Mission Sunday. And I believe the theme is we cannot but speak about what we have seen and heard. That's what we're doing in Real Presence. That's the vibrancy of faith. We can't, we can't help ourselves. It comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. We can't help ourselves. We, we have to tell what we have seen and hear, heard. That's vibrancy of faith. We've encountered Jesus Christ, or more likely, he's tapped us on the shoulder in some way. And if, if, we, if we're conscious of that, it's not a matter of should I evangelize. It's, it's, it's the logical outcome. I can't help it. I can't help but speak about what I've seen and heard. If what, if, because what we've seen and heard in Jesus is so incredibly profound. And that's what the apostles said in the Acts of the Apostles when they had none of those resources. We can't help ourselves. And so I'll, we pray in a particular way this week for the missionaries. We think of people who left everything behind <clears throat> to serve in mission territories, people from our own diocese who serve in religious orders um, or lay missionaries who are around the world living in abject poverty so as to do what Jesus did, to enter in to the lives of other people so that they can speak about what they have seen and heard, to enter into um, the reality, the messiness of human life everywhere. So we pray for our missionaries. This is a weekend where we support our missionaries. And we, you know, we, we have mission appeals in all of our parishes. And those are important because it's not just the collection. I mean, we've taken a little bit of a loss these last two years with COVID. We've gotten communications from the um, missionaries. But there's a real value in having the missionaries come and speak to us. Because in a sense, they're the ones out in the field coming back to tell us what's happening. Because we need to know that. We need need to be in solidarity with those who are doing the missionary work far and wide. So we pray for our missionaries. We support our missionaries this weekend with the collection, with material uh, support. And we recognize that we are all called to be missionaries and that the very first mission is right there in our homes where we pass on the good news of Jesus Christ to one another, where parents simply speak the name of Jesus to little babes who... who can't process it, but they begin their lives. They bring their children for baptism so that they begin this friendship with Jesus Christ and to speak his name. Great missionary acts of, of religious articles, the crucifix in your house, the, the nativity set. You're a missionary, and your mission field begins right there in your home, but it doesn't end there either. We don't rest with that. We know that we have to be missionaries bearing witness to Christ, bearing witness to everything we have seen and heard with the vibrancy of faith out in the marketplace so that others might look at us and say, where do I get what you have? (laughs) Bishop Brennan, could you close us with a prayer and a blessing? Yes. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, you send us out like you sent your apostles to 
baptize, teach, to proclaim your truth, to bring the good news of your life, your cross and death, your resurrection to a world that so, so desperately needs to know you. We ask you to fill us with hope, to build up our confidence, our boldness in you, but our humility in knowing that it's not about us, but about your power working through us. May all things redound to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you for joining Bishop Brennan for a dialogue on the faith. You can view Bishop Brennan's weekly addresses through the Diocese of Columbus YouTube feed, or you can listen to the podcast at stgabrielradio.com or on the St. Gabriel Radio app.